In this wee chat, which took place backstage at the Great Philharmonic Hall of Liverpool, I talked to Mike Seal, who's an associate conductor for the CBSO, the prestigious City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. And Mike also conducts for other top orchestras. Mike talks about how he gets the most from his players, how he helps them feel more confident, what mental training techniques he uses to help his mental triggers, how long it takes to learn a score, and other fascinating stories. He includes lots of sporting analogies along the way, especially ones around the game of cricket, which is one of the loves of his life. So enjoy this wee chat over a cup of tea with the brilliant Mike Seal. Welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People, hosted by Dr. Allison Rodius, Professor of Sports Psychology at John F. Kennedy University. In each episode, Allison talks to highly successful people in music, sport, and the boardroom. She digs into the mental training techniques that they use to ride out the waves that challenge them in work and in life. So enjoy these We Chats with Brilliant People. Welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People. Today I am super excited to talk to Mike Seal, who is the Associate Conductor of the CBSO, which is a very prestigious orchestra. Uh, it's the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. We are here today at the Liverpool Philharmonic Hall, and uh, Mike has been doing some work up here in Liverpool, which is a city very close to my heart. So, welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So Mike, could you introduce yourself for the audience? Tell everybody a little bit about your background. So my background is <clears throat> I'm a musician. Uh, I was a violinist with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra for 22 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then during that time, I uh, went into the conducting world and I've been a, either assistant or associate conductor with the CBSO for the last 10 years, but also have been um, fostering or garnering a career outside of CBSO as a freelance conductor. Um, and in July last year, I gave up playing the violin and I'm now full-time conductor, conducting CBSO, but also anybody else who wants me, which is <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm here in Liverpool this week. Anybody yeah, who wants you. Anybody nice. who wants me. Yeah. Uh, do you still play? Uh, since July, I think I've played twice, <laughs> mainly because I've been too busy. Yeah. Uh, I played at a friend of mine's wedding. Nice. Um, but other than that, sometimes you know, maybe to, just to try out a Boeing before I go into an orchestra, but hardly any. So you wouldn't time. play any more for pleasure, or it's just it's too soon? or It's too soon at the moment. Yeah. yeah too soon at the moment. Um, yeah. I, I can envisage that I will, yeah. but at the moment I'm just concentrating so hard on conducting. Yeah. Um, an awful lot of conducting, the time in being a conductor is spent actually in a study learning the scores. Okay. Um, before you can get to rehearsing and performing, uh, just learning the, the notes and uh, marking up your scores, it just takes so much time. So how does a conductor do that then? How do you, how do you learn the score when you don't have an instrument necessarily, or, or do you do it with an instrument? I don't do it with instruments. Some conductors do play on the piano yeah. and, and learn it that way, um, and they're probably very lucky for it because I, I don't play the piano. Sometimes I go, I will go and figure out some chords on the piano at home. Um, I'm lucky in that I would say that 95% of all of the music I've conducted in the last 10 years, I've probably played it all already. So I've okay. got a, an, an idea in my head of what, yeah, of what, of what it should sound like, of of what I'm expecting problems might be, ensemble, whatever. Um, the other 5% are, are often new pieces of music and there's nothing else you know, to go on other than you just have to get in there and get your hands dirty and learn the structure of the music, learn what the, the lines are that you want the audience to hear primarily and then secondarily and um, and it just takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a long, long, long time. Um, but I'm not, some conductors mark up their scores very much with ideas and thoughts and Others write nothing in their scores and just read the scores it goes along and, and I'm a marker-upper. So, uh, yeah, I spend hours in my study writing things in. Um, yeah. But also after I've performed something or rehearsed something, I'll write something in for the next time. Yeah. And then it's my document, it's my book, uh, it's my 
thoughts on the piece. And they're, they're never always the same. Then you go back to a piece two years later and think, well, actually, my ideas have changed. And they just, hmm. it becomes like a manual. Um, because, you know, your ideas and thoughts on music does change. Could it also change with your moods and emotions? Or are you um, technically different two years later? What, what's different? Um, I think there's a possibility, possibility that, you know, sometimes you're a better conductor and you can do things in a different way because you think you can achieve it. Mm. But I think more often than not, the problem is that unless the music was really written in the last 100 years, if you go back much further than that, what you get is... You know the mu- the music, the the dots, the lines, the dashes. It's all on the page, on the paper, and on the page. But often it's not detailed, mm-hmm. and so there is an infinite possibility of how you can the music can phrase, can be shaped, can be balanced so that the you the the audience hears what you think they should hear primarily. There are infinite uh, variations on that. In the last one hundred years, composers have got a lot more detailed, and actually mm. from a, Maybe even further than that, but you know, I can take Elgar for instance. If you actually play what Elgar wrote in his scores from about the first symphony onwards, and maybe a little bit earlier, it's like a technical drawing. It's wonderful, and everything comes out of you perfectly. Mahler's the same. If you do what Mahler actually asks, it's wonderful. It just it works. Um, and a lot of composers have took that template and thought, well, if I want to hear that, I'll make sure that the naughty conductor doesn't mess around with it. <laughs> And if it does what, what's written, or all the orchestra, whatever's written, then I'll, my feelings will come out, out a lot yeah. clearer. Before then, it just wasn't written down as, as often and as um, fastidiously. as. Um, so th- what I'm saying is you can come back to a piece two years later and think, you know what, maybe that balance, uh, this time I'll, maybe I'll try it a different way. Maybe, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll try it in a, you know, just hearing somebody else slightly more or a chord in a slightly different uh, balance. Um, and what's interesting is, yes, you'll mood with some pieces of music. You know, it's, some pieces of music it's very difficult to get yourself in the in the mood for it. Mm-hmm. Um, now I've conducted we the, these concerts this week. We're doing ten concerts uh, as you speak. Well, as we speak now, we've just done the eighth. Uh, and ba- the first movement, Beethoven Five, is in every single concert, mm-hmm. which is driven. It's it's potentially you could, you could call it angry. You could call it it's fire. It's everything. You know all the energy, mm-hmm. and and you've got every time you get there, you've got to think right. We're going to go for this. You can't half conduct the first move to base yeah. five. You yeah. just can't do it. I was going to say you yeah. can't half ass it. Not at all. Yeah. No, you've just you've just got to fly into it, and it's got to be like an exploding ball of energy. Yeah, you have to. You just have to be like that. Yeah. Um, other pieces of music, and you. you, you, you you don't need that energy, but you might need to put yourself mentally in a different place. So um, how do you do that? Thank you for that segue. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll give you one example. When I was a violinist, I mean, obviously we're talking about conducting, but I do use similar things. But the one example I can always give you is that I used to um, play in a very small group that used to do concerts in the evening, adult concerts. And, um, and I, every single show, I had to play the, thir- the the main title from Schindler's List by John, John Williams. Now, that's very emotive music. It's, it's, yeah. But every single time you did it, you weren't always in the same frame of mind. Sometimes you were tired, sometimes you'd have a brilliant laugh having tea before you go on to the concert. And then, like that, you have to get yourself into Schindler's List. I had a fail-safe way of doing it. I shut my eyes, and I, and I imagined the little girl in the red coat... Mm. And the minute I saw the little girl in the red coat from the film, I was in the mood to play Schindler's List. It mm. was an instant thing. Mm. Didn't matter. I could be laughing with Mark next to me, the clarinetist, in the previous number, having a great time. And then Pete would stand up, the guy who, who ran the concert, said, and now we're going to do the build up. And I'd just shut my eyes and see the little girl in the red coat. Then I was there. And the same when you're conducting, if, for me, if I, can, if I can find some sort of mental image to put me in the right frame of mind, then it's great. Um, so, um, we, in sports psychology and performance psychology, we'd call that visualization or imagery. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, is that something that you would do in addition to right before you would do it? 
would you ever do it as when you were away from the concert hall and you were um, imagining practicing conducting or practicing playing? Is it? Well, I mean, the funny thing about conducting is that it's very difficult to practice because you've got nobody to bounce off. Right. Uh, and and actually, if you're conducting properly, you're not just going through a set of rehearsed moves. You're actually responding to what mm. the orchestra is giving to you. Mm-hmm. Often, I will whilst walking. I don't know, the station or whatever, I will I will be mentally re- rehearsing or hearing a piece in my mind mm-hmm. and thinking, well, actually, the shape should go in that direction. Um, and the other way I the other way I do ha- help myself with visual or uh, some sort of visualization might not be a picture in my mind like the look of a red coat, but it, it I will write something at the, on the front page of a score mm-hmm. just to remind me to think about speed or a specific passage or the architecture of a, of a 20 minute first movements of a symphony yeah. somewhere for me to head towards I don't, don't just go in blindly attacking right. bar one right but whatever you do in bar one impacts on, and the high point might be 300 bars away yeah so if I'm thinking about 300 bars away then I can think about how to get there and sometimes you just write something in the, in the top left hand corner of the first page to make me think right don't forget <laughs> you might need to start like a ball of energy exploding but you've still got to get to there, right. to bar three hundred. Um, so yeah, it's, it, that that visualization thing for me. It's a little mental trigger to think. Right, don't just go in here like a bullet at a china shop. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be create. It's got to be thought about the architecture of it all. Right, and um, obviously, you know, visualization just has the connotation of being visual, of course. But when we use the word imagery, it has more. It, it, it can contain all the senses, mm. and obviously, auditory is huge yeah. in music. Absolutely. Is mm. there any way that you uh, use auditory imagery at all as you are thinking about, um, you know, what you're going to be doing, or, or in, in preparation for your? Um, I, I think going back to high points of um, high points of music. You, know, you, you you have to imagine what that high point will be, mm. especially if there's a long crescendo together or a long build-up. Mm-hmm. You have five minutes getting... You need to conduct the first movement of Shostakovich's which is 10 symphony. It's 22 minutes long. Mm. And there is, there is definitely a high point. Well, there is a, it's a very long high point. There's right. basically five One minutes. Big, long it's, just, it's just five <laughs> minutes of, 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 of absolute power. And, and it's not anger. It's just it's a menace, really. But if you misjudge how to get there, yeah. that five minutes becomes ten minutes. And so you, you have to imagine all of the time whilst you're doing the build-up, what's the top. So it's no, it's no good get, conducting like a whirling dervish three minutes out when actually you need, you need the last push towards the end. Yeah. And I, what I often say is that the last, the, the last crescendo has got to be like almost like a wheelchair ramp. Is that what often happens is people see the high point mm-hmm. And when they get there, they give an extra bang, which means that you, rather than a wheelchair ramp up to the top point, you get a wheelchair ramp to a point below it, and then you have to. Then there's a step, yeah, which is wrong. It should all. It should always just grow and grow and grow until it can't. There's nothing left. Yeah. Um, and so, or in an auditory way, you're always judging from minutes out what you know what the top is, right? And you've got to think, right? How am I going to get there? Uh, in the best way. So that the audience just are amazed by it, and yeah, but also in the most faithful way to the school. So. Almost like um, cycling, in a way, like mm. cycling up a hill. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you know that you've got to yeah. get to the top of the hill, and you know yeah. there's actually stuff actually after the hill very often, but yeah. um, it sounds like you're, you know, in the Tour de France or something. Yeah. You know, you're going, yeah. f- going for it, knowing... You're in it for a while, and there's lots of twists and turns, yeah. but you, you know, you're heading up there. And, and the other one that's just popped into my mind is a long distance runner. The guys who, mm. who are, they're not the guys who run out, go out from the. I'm not talking about a David Radisha who just starts at the front, blitzes it, and finishes. I'm talking about the ten thousand meters who, you know, you're you're in and around it, but you know that you've got to leave something for the last four, six, eight hundred meters. Mm-hmm. It's no good. It's no good spending, you know, spending all your energy earlier on. There has to be the build up to the end. There, right. ha- there has to, be, and you have to pace it. Um, and and that, I think that's some of the hard when you first start conducting is knowing is how to pace a very long stretch of music. Yeah, it's very really easy to come out and conduct. I don't know um, a, a three minute overture, 
To well, I don't room. think I could do no, it. But, <laughs> but, but, but you know, something that's sort of crash, bang, bullock, and off we go. Yeah. It's when you're building something, as I said, like that Shoskiri Symphony, or a Bruckner, or where the, just these spans, the architectural spans of music are so long and so huge. That's where you need waypoints, and then you need high points, and you need to keep yourself in check. And always in, your, in the back of your mind or in your inner ear is, that's the top sound. That's yeah. where I'm going. We mustn't get there before, and we must hit that point spot on right um, right and we all have to do it together absolutely yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. see that's yeah, what's fascinating yeah. about your role is that you're uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the interview started um you're kind of like the captain or, yeah. the, or the manager of your team and you are orchestrating your your team and you are i think you described yourself as an engineer a, ba a, a balance engineer so you're putting all those pieces together and and you know, creating that amazing yeah. sound from what all those people can do. That's well. I think the, ba the balance engineer thing is is a twofold thing. Is the is that pick any piece of music you like. It could be a national anthem if you want. Mm. With well, the national anthem, you need to hear the tune that everybody sings. But then, the, then the secondary line might be something underneath that, and then the third, then there's a third line of harmony, and then there's a fourth line bass line. But without, if the bass line isn't loud enough, it all feels a bit, you know, um, wobbly. So all of the time, you're trying to convey to the audience what you think the most important line is. Sometimes, once the audience have heard that tune three or four times, you might want to bring out a secondary line that's also quite interesting. And, and then the audience go, oh, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Or some, something you find interesting. Going back to the long crescendo thing, yeah. there, there, very, there really is a sense of, of how to reach the top. And there are certain instruments that the minute you, you give them the gesture which says, now it's your turn, mm -hmm. it, it, they, they will push everybody up. So, I mean, as a violinist, if you... It, Nobody ever tells you this. I'm not sure that they do. I, I tell kids now how it works. If I tell them I was a conductor and I, t and I, and I make the cellos and basses play slightly louder as a string section, there is, a, there is an almost inbuilt automatic reaction that all violinists do is they hear the basses go up and go, oh, OK, we'll play louder. Whether it's written in the music or not. Mm. Then if, if, as a string, string player and possibly a wind player, if you hear the brass and especially the low brass do exactly the same thing, all of the strings go up. And then, just, and, and but the final pierce de resistance or the coup de gras or whatever is if you ask the timpani to do a to do a big crescendo, mm -hmm. the big kettle drums at the back or the bass drum, but normally the timpani, then everybody will give you that final push. They didn't even know they had sometimes. Mm. So if you if you want the if you want the crescendo to go r all the way to the top, that, then the, the people to give the gesture to in that order. So, Low strings through low woodwind through low brass. Mm -hmm. Finally, we want to go over the top. There we go, tickling mm -hmm. on you go. Um, and that's the way you know I look at it as being a balance engineer. Um, and it's not about beating time mm -hmm. necessarily at that point. It shouldn't be. Um, but as if you're a manager of a fo football team, all of their ensemble and training should have happened in the in the rehearsals beforehand, playing yeah. together. Um, and trusting each other and hearing each other, they shouldn't have to rely on a man with a stick or a woman with a stick or anybody with a stick. Yeah, you know, it's up to, they should be playing together by that point. That's sort of the weekly training sessions. You, know, you don't very difficult for a football manager to have any impact on anything from the sidelines. He might be able to whistle, and my job's much like him. You know, might be able to whistle and say, "What are you doing? Stood over there. I, I can help out with something <laughs> in the concert, but I can't. Yeah. I can't fundamental errors. I can't stop." By that point, um, no. Yeah, it's you can't even put a, a sticking plaster over. You, no, well, you, you, you can, but um, it, unless you can pinpoint exactly what it is, um, which you have to. Yeah. But even then, sometimes you're 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 only trying to correct it s slightly. Sometimes they overcorrect it. They think, "Oh, I'm rushing. Well, I'll slow down." And they think, "Well, you're dragging." Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, it, it's a lot easier if, if everybody knows their roles within the, the team in the first place. Right, right. And they all trust each other and doing each other's, doing the roles well. Yeah, um, that was actually something yeah. that I wanted to touch on because you had mentioned that to me before about um, the element of trust. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you create, help create and facilitate that within your orchestra? <laughs> uh, I, I stumbled on a way of do, doing it. Um, 
my big passion outside of music is cricket. Mm -hmm. I played for a club side. Um, I've played since I was a kid. Uh, and recently uh, had some coaching by the Dougie Brown, the, the head coach of Warwickshire. All of us did, members of the CBSA. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to teach us to, to feel better. Mm -hmm. and, and it was to do with... He said, you know, basically I want you to try... It was an indoor tournament, so an indoor cricket pitch is, is very confined and it's surrounded by nets, high-sprung nets, so the ball will... The ball's not allowed to touch the net, or you shouldn't touch the net. So that, what he was saying was, if you've got a chance to throw at the stumps to, to run somebody out, you throw at the stumps. And what I'm going to teach you is I'm going to teach you that if you throw at the stumps, there will be somebody behind to catch you, mm -hmm. to catch the ball. Because I'm going to teach you your roles, so that if you're not throwing it, you have a secondary role, which is to be there and to stop the ball. So that when you pick up the ball, you must turn and you must immediately throw the ball at the stumps and trust that the other guy is doing, and here comes the word, uh, is doing his shit. Yeah. So your shit is to pick up the ball and throw at the stumps. The other guy's his job, and he's do if he does it, his shit correctly, he stood behind it. So he said, the mo your team motto is remember your shit. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Which, of course, when we turned up, we were shouting it in the game. <laughs> the other teams thought it was hilarious because they, they, they were adding apostrophes in <laughs> and, and extra E's to you, the word your. We ran more, t more people out in that tournament because of this training method. Yeah. Because we just trusted each other. So I came away from that thinking, but it's no different in an orchestra, really. If I, as a violinist or, or, a, or if a flautist or a clarinetist has the tune, and the tune's got to fit with a motor rhythm, and that can be the seconds and violas and the, for the horns, but well, the bass line as well, you have to trust that the, the bass line and the motor rhythm are doing their job properly. You have to trust that they're right. If you can hear them, play with them. Especially people like double basses and percussionists, their job is to basically a bomb, 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 all for their entire career. Mm -hmm. So they must be good at it. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be. They wouldn't be in an know. orchestra. Yeah. yeah, and you know, side drum, you know, bum, 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 bum. that's their that's their job. Yeah. That's what they're paid to do, and they're good at it. They wouldn't have got in an orchestra if they weren't good at it. So don't don't throw it out. Don't mistrust it. Don't think, well, what are you doing that for? Trust it. And but and if you can hear it and play with, uh, hear it, play with it. And then my job as a conductor becomes a lot easier because I don't have to beat time every single bar like a bandmaster. You hand over the responsibility of tempo and ensemble to everybody in the industry. So, well, just listen to the guy playing the side drum. Don't, there's no need to follow me. My job is now to to affect and assimilate how you play it, mm. not when you play it. Mm -hmm. the, the way, so, if you trust somebody who's doing their job properly, mm -hmm. it works perfectly. If that person isn't doing their job properly, that's when the conductor stands in and says, I'm sorry, you're not doing your job properly, right. like a football manager would do with a defender. So, you know, why are you stood there? You're, 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 you're causing um, the offside trap to fail or whatever it might be. And so it's exactly the same with me. I can turn around to bases and say, please don't drag there, just play. And then everybody will trust you. Huh. Um, and so you know, my, my big thing with violins and with flutes, but mainly with violins, is to say to them, you're never in charge of the rhythm of an orchestra, ever. It's hard enough playing the violin. You have millions of notes to play. Why do you Why do you want to be involved with the rhythm as well? Let the people who do rhythm do rhythm. Mm -hmm. You play the tunes, and it all fit together wonderfully well, and it does work. Mm -hmm. And especially with with youth orchestras and with amateurs, who most of the time have got this thing: we must follow the conductor. We must follow the conductor. Right. The problem with the following the conductor is everybody's view of what the conductor's beat is, is different, and where the beat is, is different, mm -hmm. because you're not making any sound, you're just making visual cues as to what you think the speed is, um, and so there can be variation in that, whereas if a, if a side drum's going bump, bada bump, bada bump, bada bump, there is no compromise, there's no, it's not up for debate, mm -hmm. your rhythm, go, your, your tune goes with that rhythm, it's mm -hmm. nothing to do with anybody waving his arms around, so it's easier for the orchestra to play together. Mm -hmm. The great orchestras play together amongst themselves in this sort of chamber music listening way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think more and more orchestras, or the, or most professional orchestras play like that anyway. Sometimes they need reminding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, they, they do, you know, the great orchestras play together without mm -hmm. the conductor is there to show them how fast he wants it to go in the main. Um, and as I said, to be a balance engineer and a musical engineer and a phrasing and architecture, mm. but he's not there, but it's just a big time. That's 
and so there must be an inherent trust within the players of Rostra mm -hmm. of everybody doing their job well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it worked. It does work. Some some people fight it, but it does it does work. <laughs> how do you um, how do you help people in your orchestra be more uh, confident? Let's say. Uh, do you think that is that part of your I think role? Part, possibly. I mean, I I think part of confidence within the string section would be look. You don't. Going back to the trust thing, just trust that these guys play, and then you can you can confidently play there. I think when it comes to solos, especially woodwinds and brasses, um, you just have to say to them, "Look, it's your solo. You do your thing." If there's anything that really offends me, I'll, I'll come and tell you on the quiet. But just play, play up. It's your solo. Mm. Just let it be. Let it let it fly. Let it go. Um, because I think what what drains confidence is when when you're micromanaged too much by conductors. Right. Um, when you says, "Well, if you just do this here and you do that there, you know, you, you almost what was a musician say? Well, why don't you come in here and play it then? <laughs> <laughs> if you want it like this and all like that, you know, my and you should be. I think as a conductor, you should be open to to, to hear people play something and go, to, "What do you know? What that's 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 better than I imagined it because you're playing it." And then you go somewhere the next week and do exactly the same piece, and another human being is playing it. And it comes in a different way, and you think, mm. well, it's a different sound, it's a different phrasing, but I like that too. Um, to mm. Never be constrained by, as I said, the notes don't always, aren't, don't always tell you everything. It's, it's a, there are human beings playing. Yeah. So you just, it's your moment, on you go. And with a simple gesture, just beck, just beckon them to and say, on you go, it's yours, it's yours. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. follow you, I'll just, you do your thing. Um, I wish people could see. I wish this was video actually, because I wish people could see you because you're actually you're making a lot of gestures. <laughs> in the, <laughs> I can tell that yeah. you're a conductor. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult not to because yeah. you, know, you can. I, you know, I can visualize people playing for me. No, you <laughs> just play. Don't get up. Uh, <laughs> it's over to you. It's, yeah. um, as we're wrapping up, do mm. you have any advice for anybody who um, would like to be a conductor and? Um, um, how you know on the maybe on the mental side of how to um, how to prepare themselves to be a good conductor. Oh, oh dear. Um, <laughs> Is that Pandora's box? Oh well, yes. Well, how long have you got? Um, I think one of the the most important things. Uh, uh, there have been great non-orchestral musician, um, non-orchestral instrument playing conductors, and there are. But to have a knowledge of an orchestral instrument. A good knowledge mm. of one in particular. I, mean, I was a string player, and I've, I considered myself incredibly lucky about that because the strings are the, the are a complicated, complicated and thing. If you're not a string player, I'm, you know, I'm lucky about that. But then to have a, a not a working knowledge, but a knowledge of all of the other instruments is a key thing. Mm. First of all, um, secondly, don't. Go into being a conductor, wanting to be everybody's friend, mm. and wanting to please everybody. Like a, lead, like a leader. It just like it ain't going to happen. Yeah. It just, um, you know, you can have ninety five percent people should go, oh, he's great, and then there will be five percent going, oh, I can't stand him, uh, and it that could be quite quite simply because not because of anything you've said or done or, or it's just it becomes a beauty contest. I don't like the way he conducts. You know, it's it's very, lots of intangible reasons why you can. Yeah. Not like somebody, um, and and also you have to be incredibly lucky. Not uh, incredibly lucky if you go through your career and don't encounter an orchestra that doesn't like you, <laughs> and sometimes you don't like them. And you know that can be five, four, or five days of, of not very nice experience. Um, Wait, I bet you could still produce some. Yeah, of course you stuff. can. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Because everybody is professional, yeah. and you yeah. can do your yeah. job and. I've seen it as a player, you know. So you know, you, you you come out at the end of a week and I actually think that was a brilliant concert, in spite of what the conductor was doing, and yeah. and and that's fine. I'm, one conductor once said to me, "Do you know?" He said, "I've conducted the orchestra sometimes better than they've played, but then there have been times they've played better than I've conducted, mm -hmm. and that's and that's an interesting yeah, like thing. It. And you know, going to sports, I'm sure there are plenty of teams and performances and matches where the team halfway through has thought, "You know what? We're not doing." This because it isn't working, and the manager hasn't changed it. It's just halfway through a half of football team has decided. Do you know what we're going to do this and come out of it on top, mm -hmm. purely by 
11 people on the pitch deciding by the sheer will of sometimes of telepathy, right, we're going to try something else. Um, and yeah, I've, I've played in concerts and um, I'm not sure I've conducted one yet that I thought, actually, I've conducted that worse than you've played it, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I've definitely played in some I thought, you know what, that was a brilliant concert, but I'm mm. not sure what, how. Right. I'm not sure how that happened, but yeah. it did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a definite, but... You know, you're not always going to get on with everybody all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and, and the other the other thing is the music. The music has got to be in your head to the point when so a, a, a player in the CBS have said to me when I first started conducting, he said, "Get the score in your head, otherwise your head will be in the score, mm. and your eyes will be your best communication devices, better than your hands and arms, really." If, if you can use them all together, well, then that's great. But if you've got the music in your head and therefore the structure and what you, where you want the music to go and you're looking at the musicians rather than with your head down looking at the notes in front of you, mm. it's so much better. Um, that's, it's hard, it, it takes a lot of time, as I said earlier, in the study to achieve that. So um, how long do you th approximately then do you prepare for um, a particular piece? It, it depends on the situation. I mean, I'm doing a concert very soon where I've just I've literally just got the music because mm. it's come from a higher company or it's come from uh, and so I've got about ten days two weeks to learn something mm. and uh, but, they're, but they're short pieces of music and that's a relatively short amount of time absolutely yeah yeah um, I did I did a concert very recently with the CBSO of um, Corn Gold Symphony which is rarely performed I'm not sure you should ever played it in fact I'm pretty sure they never had uh, I started learning that. I started learning the score 11 months before the concert, in, intertwined with other things I was learning at the same time. Wow. But then, you know, do you know what? I've been listening to that piece as a fan of it for five, six, seven, eight years. Mm. And so it was always going in there. But just with the dots on the paper, writing in my thoughts and, and thinking about all the things I talked about earlier on, 11 months, on and off. So wow. I, I put it down and then go to another concert project and another two hours of music I had to learn. And then when I've done that... I might then go back to the Cornwall and have another couple of weeks on that and then go to another project and, and then come away. So, for instance, I've got something coming up in October. I'm doing the Alpine Symphony by Richard Strauss. I'm already starting marking that up now. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and again, when I've got a fallow period, I'll go back to the Alpine Symphony. And, and mm -hmm. So that when I get to the, those rehearsals and that concert, my head is up, out looking at the musicians because the music's already gone in. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not staring at the score thinking, well, what's over the page? And yeah. I already know what's over the page. You've got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. gone in. You have to. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. It sounds like um, some of your top tips then overall are be thick-skinned. <laughs> yes, <bit>. yeah, <laughs> definitely be thick-skinned. And yeah. um, meticulous preparation. Absolutely. For the, the old adage, fail to prepare, be prepared to fail, is n Never more true than as a conductor. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and a lot of musicians are really can can spot when you've done your homework. They right. really like. Well, he's done his work. He know he knows Appreciate what he wants. It. Doesn't necessarily I agree. Doesn't mean they agree right. with what you want them to do. But if you're committed and you've done your homework and you've really worked, then there's there's a chance they'll 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 be persuaded or they'll be yeah. they'll sway to your way and they'll yeah. play for you anyway. If you don't if you're not done the homework in the first place. Yeah, be prepared to not go down very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody, yeah. Um, well, I could talk to you for hours because this is very fascinating Thoroughly for me. Um, I did mention before, actually, my dad used to be a conductor a long time ago, amateur conductor. Yeah. So I, yeah. I've, uh, conductors are very near and dear to yeah. my heart. Um, I have one last question yes. that I've been asking everybody at yeah. the end. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you try to do tomorrow? If I knew I couldn't fail, couldn't fail. what would I try to do tomorrow? Uh, oh, God. That's difficult. In my own field or just anywhere? Whatever you, however you want to answer. Uh, in my own field, it would be uh, to conduct one of about four or five pieces with the Berlin Philharmonic. Mm. Uh, outside of my own field would be to go and bat... Uh, and score a hundred because I've never done it, uh, and and I will for keep, England uh, for, for anybody. For, uh, <laughs> and seriously, for anybody. for anybody. Preferably, actually, before England, for my club, I would love to yeah. score a hundred for my club. Uh, and I've never. I'm, most I've ever scored is seventy four, not out. I'm 
I ran out of time. I can help you with some squats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll need to help me with more, more with technique, <laughs> technique and fitness, more than anything else. But yeah, I'm mean, outside that. That uh, as, as a sporting yeah. thing, I'd love to do that. That's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, I'm trying. To, I've been trying to educate my students about the joys of cricket. So. Yeah. Um, I'm working on them, definitely. Well, it's the greatest game of all. All you have to tell them is that it's a team game, but at every single moment of that team game, it's a 1v1 battle. If you think of it like that, mm. it's the greatest of all games. You don't get that in football, you don't get that in, in any sport at all, mm -hmm. other than there are 11 of you, and at every single moment it's a 1v1 battle. The batsman against the bowler. And that's what makes it great. It's brilliant. Endless tactics. What more do you want? It takes five days. You're a great get marketer the, for the sport. <laughs> Well, Mike, it's been a pure pleasure. Thank you it so really much has. for being part of this series. Thank you. Tune in next time, everybody, to see who we have on WeChat with Brilliant People. Thank you. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed these WeChats. You can follow WeChats with Brilliant People on Twitter at WeChats and Facebook. And subscribe to the podcast series on iTunes or any Droid platform. We Chats with Brilliant People.